Hello, everyone, and welcome to this third um, seminar or third series, third seminar, I should say, of this uh, Vega seminar series. Here it is. Um, my name is Simon Rue. I lead the Viral Genomics Group at JGI, and on behalf of the Vega co-organizing committee, I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this special seminar that we have today. Um, this is really a replacement for what would have been the keynote speech um, at the original Vega seminar. So we will have only one speaker today, uh, Eddie Holmes, to talk about um, a little bit of SARS-CoV-2 and um, in more general term, everything about all the RNA viruses that are on Earth. Um, that means the logistics are a little bit different from the previous Vega seminars. We'll uh, actually stay in this Zoom for the whole, the, uh, whole time and we will use all the Q&A for all questions about this talk. Um, and with that said, um, I will turn it over to Tanya Voiker, our chair for today, to introduce um, our speaker. Thanks, Simon. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Tanya Voike, and I'm a senior scientist at the Joint Genome Institute. And I will be moderating today's Vega workshop. As Simon mentioned, we have a special seminar uh, with a little bit of SARS-CoV-2 today a topic which I'm sure has been on everyone's mind uh, quite a bit. And for that, we have a very special speaker, someone who needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Eddie Holmes received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Anthropology at the University of London and his PhD at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And he's now a professor at the University of Sydney. Eddie holds many fellowships, such as the most recent ARC Australian Laureate Fellowship, and he's published a stunning number of seminal papers. He's given back to the community by serving on the editorial board of a long list of journals. Um, Eddie dedicated his career to studying all sorts of various sorts of infectious diseases, uh, their emergence and evolution, and in particular focused on a more mechanistic understanding of how RNA viruses cross species boundaries to end up in hosts like us. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's hear more about this exciting work and let's welcome Eddie and hear about his latest research on the RNA virus sphere. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, look, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, JGI, um, GI probably do the best work on, on characterizing the virus here anywhere on, on Earth, really. So it's extraordinary work that JGI do. So I'm very uh, proud to be discussing my stuff with them today. So, um, so my talk is a very broad thing, and I've, the title's obviously very kind of broad and slightly pompous, that trying to describe the RNA virus sphere from ecosystems to emergence. What that's actually going to entail is the following topic. So right at the start, I'm going to talk a little bit about very about broad terms about, about the virus sphere and the technique that we've used to try and describe that virus sphere called metatranscriptomics. And this first bit, I will mention a bit on SARS-CoV-2. So that's interesting. Then I'm going to talk a bit more, bit more broadly about the evolution and particularly the ecology of, of vertebrate RNA viruses in general. Okay. That'd be the kind of heart of my talk. Then a bit about nano viruses, a kind of side issue, because they're actually very interesting, but kind of forgotten about, but actually very cool. And then right at the end, back to kind of, you know, where we are today, emerging diseases. And, and I'll consider, can we actually predict what might go next? What, what panic might occur next? And what kind of strategies can we use to try and stop it? So that's the plan. So right back to the beginning, um, the first thing I want to kind of propose to you is that our view of viruses and is, is a slightly biased and distorted one. And it's, of course, it's being shaped by things like COVID-19 that we're all kind of experiencing. That's why I'm sitting in my office in my back bedroom rather here in Sydney. And if you actually go back and look at the, the early history of viruses, and I apologize if you know all this sort of stuff, but right from the from like almost day one, the view of viruses were that they were pathogens and that we were most interested in those pathogens, these viruses, the pathogens that infected humans. So, or rather, or humans, things that humans needed. So here, the, here's just some bullet points on just the early, the first discovery of viruses back in the end of the 19th century, a few people working simultaneously in, in parts of Europe. I won't describe it in detail, but the first virus that they were interested in was, they discovered was, was tobacco mosaic virus. Of course, tobacco was a very important cash crop back in the day, still is, unfortunately. And so there was a great interest in trying to find out what was what was causing diseases in, in, in tobacco. And then not long after um, TMV was discovered, 
a variety of other viruses were isolated. So things like um, foot and mouth disease, FMVA, FMDV, yellow fever, rabies, polio, then finally bacteriophage. So you can see that right early on, these are mainly pathogens. And so very early on, as I say, there's a focus on viruses as pathogens and the focus on viruses um, that infect species, uh, that infect animals or plants that are important for humans. And that kind of view has, dis I think it's distorted our whole knowledge of what viruses are. We think of them as disease causing almost you know, entirely. And I think what we need to do, and I think you're, you're, hopefully I'll, this is the kind of big theme you'll see implicit in my talk, is that we need to kind of move away from that. So though we, we always think about viruses in terms of emergence, and that's in my title. Okay, so here, for example, this, of course, that's what SARS-CoV-2 is. So here we have an animal and a virus going from a human and spreading into an epidemic. Rather than just think about emergence, we also need to think about viruses as part of the ecosystem, okay? And in fact, the way humans interact with the natural world, okay, be it, be it mammals or birds or insects or plants, at the same time, we're interacting with viruses and viruses are actually a natural part of that ecosystem. And maybe disease is more about per perturbations of those ecosystems. So I think we need to kind of shift in thinking about what viruses are and what role they play. And hopefully that you'll kind of see that today. So as I say, I think we've, we've, we've had a, a long, strong biased view of, of, of what viruses really are. And I think part of that is because our sampling of it has been so extraordinarily biased. And as again, most of the history of virology has been based on looking at things important for humans. What you're now seeing, and JGI are doing fantastic work on this, is we're now seeing a, a wider sampling of organisms to understand what the virus sphere might actually be. So for example, I'm particularly interested in, in animals. And if you should look at the, look at the tree of metazoa, these the animals here, most of our knowledge of viruses comes from a very few phyla of animals. So one is the, the chordates, right? because I'm a chordate, you're a chordate. So we have, we have lots of viruses from chordates. And then the rest of the animal phyla, we really only have a fair number of viruses from arthropods. And of course that's because arthropods contain things like mosquitoes and ticks that, that transmit. So there's a huge bias there. Most of this tree of metazoa, flatworms, nematodes, sponges, whatever, we haven't sampled. We have no idea what viruses they carry. And even in the chordates, there are huge sampling biases. This little figure I put together uh, a little while ago. This is just a, a, a this, down here you're seeing different stages in chordate evolution. So here we've got the sort of the first, the earliest chordates, so lancelets, like amphioxus, they're the basal chordates. We've got tunicates, hagfish, uh, the fish, um, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Okay, these are kind of major steps in evolution. Here, little heat maps is showing that the viruses, these are different virus families that have been found. And the darker the color, the more viruses. You can see that mo virtually nearly all the chordate viruses are from mammals. So the retrovirus is the most sampled, also mixed viruses, quite a few. Um, so quite a few from birds, fewer numbers of reptiles, very few from amphibians, almost none from lungfish. A, a, a bit more from fish, I'll discuss a lot of those today. But the rest of this tree hasn't been sampled. Okay, we haven't looked. And so I think the, big, the biggest questions, and this is the question that I'm dealing with, and I think what JGI are doing as well is, how large is the virus sphere and how is it structured? What kind of shape is this diversity of viruses you're seeing? And then if you look at in individual species or populations, what determines the diversity and abundance of viruses and their structure in, in those individual species? And I'll, and I'll cover quite a lot of that today. So I think they're the big, the big questions. Now, so what I do as a living, what my kind of work is trying to understand that, is by trying to characterize the virus sphere. And the way I, the way I, and that, coincides at the same time by chance looking at disease emergence because those, those two things are kind of like the same the same thing if you characterize the virus there you can also kind of work out what's spreading what's causing disease so a couple of years ago we actually published a paper in in um I think it was nature microbiology just showing how you could use genomics to try and characterize the virus sphere and then understand disease emergence and of course this was you know uh, precedent to the to the to the, the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. So you had a figure here just in this in this paper, just showing the kind of steps you can use genomics for to, to characterize the virus. So here you have you got a new disease, you can have your first detection of, of your first of what's so what actually is causing that disease. So if you're very lucky, your person's ill over a PCR machine, that's not normally the case, of course. So first you have detection, then you have snapshot. So once you've got the first sequence, what is it, where does it come from, what's its kind of like gene composition? Then you can start to look at transmission chains. So as you've got the first cases, you can start to um, work out who's infected, who and spreads through the community. And finally, and this is sadly where we are with SARS-CoV-2, you can start to look at 
global large scale patterns of spread because that's where we are. Very sadly, it was a very in it was a great in this period a really good bit of clever trolling. We actually had a virus um, spreading globally, um, and that and from a particular place in Florida. That's actually exactly Mar-a-Lago. You can actually do the coordinates, but no one kind of got the joke. Some subtle trolling for us. Anyway, so that's the kind of steps that you can do. And my most of my work is at the kind of front end, detecting viruses and trying to work out where they come from, what they're related to. And the way I kind of do this is a very simple thing. I imagine, imagine the virus sphere, imagine disease emergence as being like fault lines. Take a very simple earthquake analogy. So it's like fault lines um, in, in earthquakes. So where humans and animals interact, that's where things can jump. That's where viruses can spread from one host to another. That's the kind of like stress point, the tension zones, okay? So you take the natural world, and what I tend to do, my group tend to do is sample where these kind of red lines are, where humans and animals interact, okay? Because that's where you can get jumping. That's where emergence can take place. So for example, humans now, encroach dramatically on because we build on places where wildlife live and that's going to expose us to viruses and that's how they can jump so my group kind of do a lot of sampling in those kind of areas and as you will become famous as you'll see shortly a lot of that work's done in, in various countries including china so here we went to a little town in southeastern china this is professor zhong zheng zhang holding a rodent and this is the guy who one of the first people sequenced the sars cov2 i'll discuss that shortly so he's holding this, this picture of my phone of, of, of a rodent and this is from one town in southeastern china called Longquan in zhejiang province and in what we did we sampled rodents in that particular town city and these are they can these rodents contain a lot of viruses including coronavirus and here's this tree here is of, of those coronavirus you don't need to know the details don't worry you can just see that these are all the coronaviruses that were known at the time and the ones in color they're from the rodents from this one town so there's some red ones some blue ones some green ones and the blue ones are beta coronaviruses they're actually quite close to size could be too this little patchwork quilt here these are the different rodent species and the colors of different viruses. you can see the kind of the, the kind of patchwork that means they're jumping so here, within one city in China, literally one place in China, you have this huge diversity of rodent coronavirus. And these rodents live around people's homes. That, and see where, where you're seeing that trap is near someone's house. So uh, literally under our feet, you have these mammals that carry coronaviruses. And these coronaviruses are jumping hosts. So it's kind of no surprise at all that things like SARS-CoV-2 appear because these viruses, these coronaviruses are ubiquitous and they jump species all the time. So that's a kind of sampling. Now, the technique that I use, I mentioned already in my kind of title, is a very simple thing called metatranscript. I won't go into any detail. It's simply total RNA sequencing. So you take your species of interest. These are birds. You take your tissue from those, or it can be a, it can be a clay or swab, or it can be a disease, a tissue from a disease animal. Um, and then we, all we do is we sequence total RNA, simple as that. The only thing we do, a little trick we do, is we deplete the ribosomal RNA. And there are various ways you can do that. And you want to try and remove as much of that as possible because that's host. You don't want that. Okay. So you're trying to deplete the ribosome RNA and you sequence what's left. And we tend to use these kind of NovaSeq technology. And what's left is all the other expressed genes, still mainly host, but you've also got virus in there, bacteria, fungi, parasite, whatever. And then you can try and use bioinformatics to go through those reads to work out what you've got, what's a virus, et cetera. And then you can kind of confirm it using various assays. So that's a very, very simple analytical technique from the transcript tones, just total RNA sequencing. Now it works very well. There are some caveats though. So one caveat is quite important. Um, it has fooled me a few times, is that unfortunately there are various sources of error. And, and one of them is, is that the reagents that we use in this, in this, in this technique are actually often um, contaminated with microbes, including viruses. So here's a paper published, um, this is now called the Kitome, I should say, a paper published a few years ago. Um, in the journal, and th this, these are these are various laboratory reagents. So you've got primers, and you've got buffers, and you've got polymerases, library kits, whatever. And these are the viruses they found in those different um, reagents. This is kind of like a heat map. See this, this particular reagent here, absolutely full of virus. And they do happen, and they and they, so you need to kind of be aware of that. It's this little thing to see. And one, and particularly the viruses you see very often in reagents are these crests, these single-stranded DNA viruses, and they're extremely commonly found. So, for example, here's a tree of all the crest viruses, and the ones that are coloured, these we found, the ones in red particularly, we found these in a in a sequencing 
of a sterile water reagent mix. So there's no there's no organism in there. So sterile water and reagents. So they they are almost certainly reagent associated viruses. And there's actually quite a few. The blue ones have also been found by other people, and the red ones as well. So there's actually quite a few of these crest viruses that are just in reagents. So you kind of have to be careful of that kind of thing. But other than that, it does work very well. So can I give you an example of that very briefly? I just want to talk talk a little bit about um, SARS-CoV-2 because I see many people are interested in this, and I'll give you a little so a slight backstory of why Mr. Zhang and I were kind of work, kind of involved in the early description of this virus. And so um, we had a number of field projects in Wuhan and Hubei province and collecting you know, various animals. And, but critically, one project we had was working in Wuhan Central Hospital. So I went to Wuhan Central Hospital in 2016. You can see my name there. It just says, welcome Eddie Holmes, for giving you a talk. Um, I host what it said anyway. And so this was in 2016. And this hospital became very famous during the early part of the pandemic. He was seen it also on pictures of Wuhan. This is where people would have been, would have been, patients would have been interpreted. So it was kind of sent the epidemic last January. And by complete coincidence, in the, the two years prior to that, out to SARS CoV 2 appearing, we were looking, we were doing metatranscriptomics or total infectome. By that, I mean looking at all the different pathogens um, in patients reporting to that hospital presenting with pneumonia and acute respiratory infection. Of course, that's exactly what SARS CoV 2 actually is. So we had a project just looking at people reporting to this hospital 2016 to 2017, and we were taking what's called a bronchio alveolar lavage sample, which is basically a lung wash, okay? And that's the sample that Professor Zhang then used to, to, to sequence the first case of SARS-CoV-2. So we were, taking, we were there on site in, a, in the same hospital taking these, um, these, these lavage samples. And we had about 408 patients plus load of controls to see what microbes they had caused disease in these, in these particular patients. And here, and the results are as follows. We haven't quite published this yet, but um, essentially these 408 patients had a huge mix of viruses, bacteria, and fungi, okay? There was one zoonotic infection. There's a, a, a chlamydia bacteria that causes psittacosis, also known as parrot fever. It's a kind of bird bacterium that can jump to humans. That's one case of that. But the rest of it was a kind of your bog standard um, viruses, bacteria, and fungi, but in different combinations. Um, critically, there was, and this is just a heat map showing you, these, these are the different viruses, these are the bacteria, some fungi in there. There were lots of common cold coronaviruses, as, as you might expect, so things like um, OC, uh, H229E, NL63, OC43, HKU1, these were all common cold coronaviruses, but there was no SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-1. So two years, up until 2000, December 2017, in that sample, we had none of those other viruses there but you can see you know it gave us a kind of um, we were on site using the techniques prior to the pandemic so it's kind of no no surprise that that's why Professor Zhang was given early samples to look at so there's that and then the other thing what we're doing now um, is obviously there's been a lot of interest in in the origin of SARS-CoV-2 I've already discussed that in any detail but looking at looking at bats that carry related coronaviruses so we've just done some recent work this is done with Feng Shi from Shandong, Alice Hughes from Yunnan. And we've sampled this, this tropical botanic garden in Yunnan province. It's about a thousand hectare plot of land. It's not caves, it's trees, and tourists go there and visitors. And in that plot of land, um, there were 26 so far novel bat coronaviruses found in the bats in this tropical garden. So extraordinary large diversity in a very, very small space. So you can imagine you know, multiplied up across all bat locations is quite incredible. Um, if you look at them, so very briefly, this is just some trees of, of, of SARS-CoV-2. These, these are all different, so, sorry, of, of, bat, of beta coronaviruses. These are different genes. Over here we have ORF1B, this is the spike gene. You can see that, so the human SARS-CoV-2 is in red. Some of the our new viruses are in, are in blue and green. The pangolin ones that you've heard about are there, the marked. And different trees are giving you different, um, Topology, different genes give you different trees because there's lots of recombination. It's very, very frequent in these coronaviruses. You look at the Auth1B tree over here, it's probably the, the, it's, it's half the genome, it's the long polymerase. 
if you look at that, you see there's, there's SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are the pangolin ones. We actually have more pangolin seropositive cases coming. Um, pangolins appear to be quite receptive to coronaviruses, interestingly. Um, so the closest ones are, are some bat ones here from Thailand, Cambodia, Yunnan, and over here. Now, what, one thing that's very interesting is you often hear that this virus called RATG13, everyone says it's the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2. It is in terms of overall genetic distance. So it is, for example, in the spike protein. But if you actually look at the whole genome, it's actually, that's a little bit misleading. In this long polymerase, in fact, there were two other viruses, RPYN06 and um, YN02 from Yunnan. They're actually a little bit closer than RATG13 because there's a lot of recombination going on. So the answer, the, the history is quite complicated. Also, um, as I think you'll, you'll see shortly, it won't be the case that SARS-CoV-2 only infects humans, bats, and pangolins. There'll be other animals in there, so they're in there as well. I can, I can guarantee that's the way disease ecology works. And these, these particular um, these bats, we got them from mainly these rhinolophus bats, these horseshoe bats, and they're very common across Southeast Asia. Just, these little heat maps are showing you the kind of distribution of, of these animals. And so if you multiply, again, you multiply up that number of viruses from that small area there, to the whole of Southeast Asia, there'll be a whole a massive abundance of these bat coronaviruses out there to be sampled. So kind of watch this space. Okay, so now let's move on, uh, given that kind of preamble, long preamble to the origin of the ecology of vertebrate viruses. This is kind of what I've, I do mainly. Um, and it started a few years ago, where, as I said, most of our knowledge of chordate viruses is been on things like mammals and birds. Very little had been done on these other chordates, particularly things like you know fish. And there's a lot of fish out there. So what we decided to do was sample. And this is my colleagues again, Professor Zhang from, from China. Sample some of these other chordates that hadn't really been sampled so much, particularly rape in fish. And so we did a lot of sampling. Um, these, these, these are different species here. We sampled mainly the ones in red, and so lots and lots of fish samples. Here are the viruses, we've got to discuss those shortly. But we sampled various tissues, so gut, gills, liver, whatever, okay? So our plan was to try and expand the virus that we're looking at kind of these lower vertebrates, so not, not birds or mammals. And, and some of the animals we looked at are really quite extraordinary. This actually exists. I thought it was a kind of joke, but this is actually a thing called the mini pizza batfish, which turns out to have it's not, you can look it up. This turns out actually, actually have quite a few um, interesting viruses. It, it does actually look like, pretty much like a mini pizza. Anyway, so that actually contains some, some quite interesting pathogens. So in doing this sequence of lone vertebrates, we found a whole bunch of viruses. And I won't go into any detail, we published this. These are just different bits. These, these trees here are different bits of the RNA virus trees. So you can take the whole RNA virus tree and you can divide it into kind of chunks. And I'm, I'm showing you those individual trunks. Doing the whole tree of RNA virus is actually very hard. So here, these are individual bits. So you've got picola viruses, calici viruses, whatever. And they're colored by, by host class. And all I want you to see is um, the reds are mammals. And they were kind of known already. And the bluey colors are the kind of fishy ones, OK? And you can see that everything you thought was, was only mammalian turns out to have ancestry in fish. So for example, phyloviruses like Ebola, classic primate, human, Africa kind of infection. In fact, there are relatives of that in fish. And that's true all over. And that's also true, so it's a very, probably, an, so probably what you're seeing here is, is a history of these viruses that dates back to the, to the earliest vertebrates, so when kind of fish first evolved. And a good example are coronaviruses, okay? So we just submitted a paper on, on, on the early history of coronaviruses. So this is just, the, so this is just the, tree of all the nido virales. These are the kind of order that contains coronaviruses. So here are the coronaviruses. Um, and this is just a tree we, we've done here of the coronavirus. It includes some new ones that I think JGI have just done in your Serratus paper. We may have named them differently, so I apologize for that, but it includes your, your data in here, okay? And what you can see, so this is the coronavirus tree. This is the tree of the of, of vertebrates, okay? What's interesting is, is that these are the ones we're used to thinking about coronaviruses, so alpha, beta, so SARS-CoV-2 is the beta coronavirus. These tend to infect mammals and birds. But down here, we have these other coronaviruses that infect other things. We have here, we have lots of fish coronaviruses, which is kind of cool. So they're kind of, on the tree, they're kind of basal to the vertebrate and bird ones. And amazing, these ones in green here, it says canna canna. 
they are actually from a New Zealand lamprey. New Zealand lamprey are jawless fish. They're actually even more basal than the tree of vertebrates. So again, you can see coronaviruses are like all these other RNA viruses, and they, they have an ancient evolutionary history that probably dates back to the origin of the, of the chordates in itself. And obviously, as you sample more, we're going to get even more of these really basal coronaviruses out there. It's quite extraordinary. So because of this, I've been, I've been a little bit obsessed by fish, right? Because fish just carry an enormous number of, of viruses. They're actually very easy to sample. Um, I'm sorry, this is coronaviruses. The same is true also influenza viruses. So until, until just a few years ago, our view of, of influenza was humans are get, get influenza viruses, we get it from either birds or from pigs. That's the kind of thing. It's humans, birds, pigs. That's the kind of our nexus for disease. What you know, we've now done with more sampling of animals is we find influenza-like viruses all over the place. So here, this is influenza. This is a simple tree. This is influenza A. Here's B. Here's C. Here, here's D. These are all the kind of mammalian bird ones. But now you're seeing from the symbols we're finding related viruses in in cane toads, in fish, in in that's an axolotl. Oh, sorry, salamander. Quite incredible. So again, a, probably a very ancient history. If you can go back and expand from the corona, from the influenza-like viruses, so this this tree here, influenza viruses, you can join it to a bigger tree of their relatives, the RNA viruses, and that's over there. But now you have this these their their relatives that are now called a new order, the articular virales. They keep changing the names. Okay, so they so these are the flu ones. They're in there. Their relatives also are often. Fish. We've actually just found recently all these other viruses out here that are from fish. So just an extraordinary diversity of these, of these viruses in fish-like hosts. Again, suggesting that all these viruses are probably as old as the, as the chordates. As I said, I've been, I've been obsessed by fish. And one of the great things about fish, they're actually really easy to sample. So one thing we've done, I'll just very briefly, we've been to the local fish market that's down the road. And as the trawlers came in, with their fish, we took the fish off, this, off the trawlers and sampled them. And they, fit, and I won't go into detail, but these fish sold as food, right? So these, you buy these to, to, to eat. These fish contain an enormous diversity of viruses. So here are the fish we sampled. Here are the viruses. I won't go into any detail. There's lots of things, astroviruses, the coronaviruses, hepatoviruses, hantaviruses, excuse me, flavor viruses. Quite incredible. So it's a huge diversity of viruses. In fact, the only fish I should say, the only fish here that's not, not sold for food in Sydney is a thing called a pygmy gobby. It's from the barrier reef. It's at the size of your thumbnail, okay? And it's, it, it's this, I think it's the shortest lived of any vertebrate. It lives for about three weeks. Even that pygmy gobby contained uh, a number of RNA viruses. It only lives for, for a few weeks, extraordinary. Interestingly, in terms of ecology, it's the kind of thing we'll get to now, there was no, um, there, was, there was some clustering of diversity in the viruses according to the host order the fish are from. So the taxonomic structure of the fish did impact the viruses they have, which means that suggests they're kind of host boundaries to what viruses you have. Interestingly though, this is the kind of thing we did this, there was no association between the viruses and their diversity and abundance and whether the fish, their population size, whether they, they lived in solitary populations. So things like, for example, flounder, they kind of live on their own in the bottom of the sea, kind of have no mates, compared to some of the other fish like mackerel, who live in big, big shoals. They didn't have, there was no, no impact of that population size we can see on virus abundance and diversity. Of course, quite a small sample size, but kind of, you kind of get into the, what shapes ecology of virus is the kind of key thing. So that was, that was fish bought in the market. We've also done the same thing for, for freshwater fish here in, in Australia. Very briefly, this is Australia, obviously this big bit of blue, this is called the Murray-Darling River Basin. It's a huge river system in Australia, it's like 2000 kilometers. In the 19, sorry, in 1800s, they, the good old uh, colonists, God bless us, introduced the common carp, European fish, into Australia for fishing, they call it like fishing carp. Now, so mid-1800s mid it's released, now, it's responsible for 90% of the total fish biomass in this massive riverbed. So it's destroying all the local native fish. Um, and so the idea is to, they want to do now is to release a virus called cyprinid herpes virus number three to kill off the carp, okay? It's a bio biological control. And the, and the locals have called it elegantly carpageddon because virus is gonna come in and knock all these 
calf off, okay, let the native fish survive. So then the question is, is the virus already in the ecosystem? And how often do viruses spread from invasive to native species? Can we actually see that? Is it safe to release this? So what actually we did was sample fish across this kind of river basin, looked at 10 native and invasive species, and you find a whole bunch of viruses, but importantly, there are no viruses shared between the invasive and native species. So that's a kind of good, there's no, there's no, uh, sip, um, uh, Cypriot herbivores three either, so, and there's no species virus ship too. So maybe that's a kind of good sign for future biological control. Um, yeah, and so what we also get from this very briefly is that what I think you can see from this and my other slide is that is that viruses are not alone in an individual host. You sample an animal, it does not have one virus alone. Viruses exist in communities. They have a kind of community a part of the ecosystem. And you can see that very, very clearly if you look at, if you look at vertebrate wildlife. And it's very obvious from birds. So we do, do a lot of work here in birds in Australia. Birds are very commonly sampled because obviously they're, they're, they're reservoirs and vectors for influenza, even influenza. And over the years, we've now sampled like um, 12 different bird species in the country. We found a whole bunch of novel viruses, actually more than this now. But the question is what so when you, when you sample a bird, you see all these different viruses in a community, what structures that community? So for example, here, here are some birds, you've got some ducks and some teals. These are all birds um, that, are, that are reservoirs for flu. And these are these colors of different viruses they have. You can see there's no kind of, this tree is showing their, their phylogenetic relationship. There's no kind of pattern to that. So what, what does shape the structure of those populations? Some viruses appear to be specialists, they only infect one host. Some appear to infect, be generalists and infect multiple hosts. So SARS-CoV-2 is generalist. So what, what dictates that? And we've actually trying to struggle to find, trying to find the ecological rules that explain this. One of them, and it's I'm sorry, this is not a very good slide at all. One that's quite easy to explain is that animals that have influenza A virus, so flu, in these birds also had more other viruses. We looked at these are ducks, these are turnstones. Sorry, not a good slide. This is just the viruses they have. It's got a heat map. You can see here that the ducks and the turnstones that were flu positive also had more other viruses. So maybe having that flu virus, it changed their immune status and allowed them to get other viruses too. So that's one factor that may have shaped the community structure of these, of these birds. Interestingly, uh, we're also doing the same work in, it's not Australia, also the Antarctic. And the birds we look at there are obviously penguins. And this is the Antarctic Peninsula, okay? Um, and if you look in penguins across the Antarctic Peninsula, amazingly, they are full of virus, okay? Particularly the ones that are closest to the tips, the more kind of uh, the, the temperate areas, they can, these penguins contain more viruses. Right down here, closer to the, you know, the further south, contain um, fewer viruses, but they have, amazing, have the same sort of diversity of sort of Australian birds and some of the same viruses. And one thing we've, we've noticed is really quite extraordinary is we can now see that some of the same viruses being found, not just in Antarctic in Australia, but also in the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. So here, and this is quite extraordinary, this is looking at, um, these are some viruses that associate with birds and ticks, okay? So this is a tree of ticks, and this is a tree of viruses found in the ticks that infect birds. And the amazing thing is you can see the same virus or very closely related viruses in completely different polar regions. So here, this is the Antarctic Peninsula, okay, down here. And you can see this virus here in red called Ronnie virus, that's there. It has a close relative that's found all the way up here in Northern Sweden. And the same here, this one here, Bonden virus in Northern Sweden, has relatives Taggart virus found in Antarctica. Okay, so circumpolar distributions of these viruses. But clearly, these birds, not in one migration step, but they're moving between these massively different regions. Okay, over a number of a number of steps, and that's and they're taking ticks with them, and that's probably allowing the vir the, the 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 world to be connected by these um, viruses to move these amazing distances. So, so the world's linked up, even without humans natural ecology has linked the, the kind of global virus sphere. Okay, um, the other thing we found, I'll just, actually, I'll, I'll just, I might even just skip this, but the other thing uh, is we also found that the age of animals also detects the virome, the, it is birds, the viruses that it has. So if you actually look at birds, you look at birds that are one year, so juveniles that are one year old compared to those that are two years old, and adults that are three years old, 
the one-year-old birds consistently have more virus and a greater abundance of virus. So virus diversity and abundance declines with age, probably because immunity is rising. So the first, the early, the younger birds, they got, haven't, haven't been exposed, they've got immunity, they get more virus. As birds age, their distribution of viruses goes down because they acquire immunity. So again, so probably mean structure also shapes virus. Okay, so very briefly now, I've just done the bulk of my talk. I'm going to talk about, a little bit about nanoviruses. This thing, this, I just want to introduce another big study we've done recently. Um, actually, before I get to that, so the reason why I got into nanoviruses was a number of years ago, we, 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 I did a lot of work looking at, a lot of work on birds, looking at not just healthy, but all the animals we've talked about so far are healthy. So the fish are healthy, the birds are healthy. There's no, no indication these viruses are causing disease. But occasionally I look at, I look at birds, animals that are ill. And so one case we looked at was that these black and white birds, they're quite common in Australia. If you ride your bike, they attack you, right? They're kind of vicious things. So things like currawongs, magpies, ravens, New South Wales. These birds were dying of this encephalitis and myo myocarditis. The question is what's causing that disease, okay? What, is it a virus? So we took various tissues from these animals and sampled them and they do contain a number of potential pathogens. Here's an astrovirus. But amazingly, these black and white birds with this disease in their brain samples, they also had a parasite called a leukocytozoan. So it's, a, it's like a, it's a, a, a protist, okay, so parasite. Also in the brain tissues of these diseased birds was, it's written down here somewhere, you can see it, a nanovirus. And of course, we didn't really think about nanoviruses because they're kind of like, people thought these are fungal viruses, they're of no interest. But there they are, in the brains, these dead birds also have this parasite, a leukocytozoan. Now, simultaneously, my, just, my postdoc, Justine Sharon, was um, doing some work, quite cool work, looking at other protists, other basal eukaryotes, particularly plasmodium. So plasmodium, you all know, is the parasite that causes malaria. And what we did, we took different types of plasmodium, all the ones that cause human malaria, so vivats, falciparum, ovale, to see were there viruses infecting plasmodium. Okay, so this, this basal parasite. And, we, and these all, again, all some from people with malaria. And in doing that, we found a novel nanovirus in the plasmodium. We called it um, um, Matryoshka, which means Russian doll virus. You'll see why in a second. So we, we discovered this novel nanovirus in this, in, 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 sorry, only found in plasmodium vivax. It's found in every plasmodium vivax strain, but not in any other human malaria plasmodium. So very cool. So completely specific to, to vivax. But what's very interesting was you then look at the bigger tree, the closest relative of this plasmodium vivax malaria nanovirus was the nanovirus we found previously in these birds found in the leukocytozoan. And these leukocytozoans are in fact close relatives of plasmodium. So probably what you're seeing here, by chance, the one of these birds, these black and white birds, that, that nanovirus is probably infecting leukocytozoan. And we found one in plasmodium. And they're both infecting these, these ancient protist parasites. This is probably a millions and millions of years old association we discovered by chance. So in fact, nanoviruses are not just fungi, fungal associated, they're in fact associated with other protists. And that's the kind of what we found. Also, it's very cool, of course, here we've got a, we've got a, a virus infecting a parasite that's infecting human causing disease, which is actually, so that's why we called it Mariushka means Russian dolls, so like a three-way interaction, virus, parasite, disease quite extraordinary very interesting okay so so bear that has to hold that thought so that's kind of that's my first interest in nanoviruses we've just recently done another big study on on sampling lots of ecotypes across china and Sadiq, so Sabina Sadiq in my group has also given a talk at this Vega conference about this a very brief talk and what we've done is sampled about 35 or so different ecotypes across china so this is mountains you can see they're in here farmland soil a lot of sediments a lot of animal poo 
forest grasslands to see what viruses they have. And they contain a huge number of viruses. This is just some of the, these are just the ecotypes here. And these are all the viruses they we found. They've all been confirmed. They've all been sort of fully genome sequenced. There's a huge amount of work in here. Overall, we have something like 2,600 completely new viruses. These are just their genome structure. I won't go into any details because it's for show, but it's a huge, huge diversity of viruses in there. And they have different, you know, different genomes segmented and segmented genome structures. Um, what's amazing is that sediments and animal feces are particularly rich in, vi in viruses. It's a huge diversity of them. So it's a massive, again, increase in virus diversity. So very cool. So um, I'll just give you two examples. These are astroviruses. So this is, um, these are this is pig. These these are found in um, these, these are novel astroviruses, and you see the ones in brown, a very appropriate color. These are all found in pig poo, pig feces. You can see just a huge diversity of novel astroviruses in fecal samples and pigs. The flavy viruses are, 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 are much more interesting. So, like for many years, I cut my teeth on you know years ago, cut my teeth looking at flavor viruses like dengue and you know and Zika and, and Japanese encephalitis, and that and we always thought flavor viruses are these kind of mammalian specific disease causing things. What you now see if you expand with this new diversity of virus fear sampling is that our previous knowledge of flavor viruses like dengue and Zika is that little bit on the tree, that little bit on the tree, tiny little bit. The rest of it is is all over here, we've got sediments, insects, just a pond water, you know, a completely new view on this. So what we thought was a very vertebrate specific vector borne set. If you look, these the actual, the origins and diversity of viruses is completely different scale and found, you know, in, in water sediments. So who knows what the real host of these viruses is, quite extraordinary. So completely changed focus. And we've also found in doing this that, that of all those viruses we found, there's 2,600 or so nanoviruses and their relatives. This now a new phylum, I believe, called the Lenar viria cotta, are all over the place. So in this, in our our sampling of China, there we've got something like almost 300 new nanoviruses, new levy viruses, new mitoviruses, and they're just an enormous diversity, particularly in sediments. So what these viruses are really infecting, I really don't know. They're just in water sediment. There could be any hosts, but an amazing diversity. I should also say that this this tree of um, this is our tree of of this phylum, the Lenar 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 viricotta. It's brand new. Um, in our tree. That phylum is not monophyletic. So it should be what you should see is the blue, the orange and green, and the reddy color grouping together. But in fact, there are some other viruses. These are actually astroviruses in between. So I'm not sure whether they're actually, I'm not sure that that phylum really exists at all. It may actually be a non monophyletic group. I'll skip that. Right. So the last part of my talk, just want to go on for another five minutes or so, is, is given all that, given that amazing diversity, can we actually, and given we're in a pandemic, is there anything we can do to take that knowledge and predict what might occur, occur next? Okay, and I'll tell the answer now, the answer is no, okay? But I'll, I'll show you how I get to that point. First off, the thing to realize is that, I think you can see it already from my talk, that these viruses jump hosts all the time. It's absolutely perpetual process. And that's what the history of all those viruses is telling you. And it's very easy to see that in, vertebr in, in vertebrate viruses uh, by doing evolutionary trees. So these are just some trees here of different vertebrate viruses. And on one side, you're seeing the host tree. On the other, so here, the hepatovirus is. On the other side, you're seeing the virus, okay? And if, they were, if there was no host jumping, they'd be a perfect mirror image of each other. All those cross lines are just showing the amazing amount of host jumping you're seeing. And you can see, look at here, the rhabdoviridae, it's like a complete mess, because that's endless host jumping. So viruses do that absolutely naturally. And you can kind of quantify it. There are various little phylogenetic techniques. I won't go into any detail. You can take, you can, you, you can metrics to see how much jumping there is. And you find that this jumping is really extraordinarily common. So here's a little metric. If there was complete, if there was no host jumping, everything was split with the host, you'd be over there. In fact, we, you're right over here. So endless host jumping. Coronaviruses are kind of in the middle somewhere. And what you see in coronaviruses is they, you see big clusters of viruses that adapt to particular classes. And I showed you again, we have those fish viruses that were different from the ones in mammals and ones in, in birds. Yet within the classes, you see lots of host jumping. And it's therefore no surprise that We've had SARS-CoV-2 as the fifth new coronavirus that's emerged in humans in the last 20 years, because they, they give us jump species boundaries all the time. So then there's that. 
Despite that, though, many people have argued that we can kind of predict or forecast disease emergence. OK, and so there's a very famous paper published in Nature a few years ago, and they said there are hot spots of emergence. And the idea was that those hot spots give us predictability. So they produce this kind of heat map and the darker the color. That's where that's a hot spot. That's where things are happening. So here you can see lots of India, China around there. There's lots of that's lots of diversity. Since then, we've had a few other outbreaks. We, just, we can put them on. So uh, swine flu occurred in 2009. That's in Mexico. It's kind of like a warm spot. MERS. 2012, look at that, Saudi Peninsula, that's a cold spot. Um, Ebola, West Africa, 2013, a bit warmer. Zika, the Americas, that's a cold spot. And of course, COVID-19, warm. So kind of mixed ability. Now it's got even more um, dramatic. And now people are, are proposing machine learning to try and work out, can we, it, it, can we predict what might emerge next? There's doing an online tool called Spill, actually quite a cool tool called Spillover, which allows you to rank your virus to work out what's its chance of emerging okay but the biggest thing our biggest idea is 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 this let's go and sequence all animal virums to, to and then we can spot which ones are going to appear in humans that's the, that's a they're big ideas to do this now i don't think that is actually going to work and i don't think that gives you any predictability so very briefly and i'm just trying to just quick this possibly i'm running out of time here um, I don't think animal virums are in any way predictive. Okay, and, I just, and here's my argument very quickly here. There's a huge number of viruses that differ by tissue type. Those distributions of viruses vary across the species you look at. So you can't just take a few samples from one, one place, one species, and say, that's it, that's the virus, it's not true, because the, the range differs. Um, you, genomics doesn't tell you whether those, whether those viruses you sample replicate in human cells. To do that, you need to do massive laboratory testing, growing viruses in cells, which is a huge number of person hours, plus lots of gain of function experiments, which maybe now will be, um, you know, people kind of sensitive about. RNA viruses evolve so rapidly, you can't really, you need to survey on a, con on a continual basis. And most of all, all those phylogenies that I've shown you, what, they're, what you're looking at, and you hope you've seen it, are time scales in millions of years. So all those trees I've shown you, they are, ancient associations yet emergence jumping like SARS-CoV-2 occurs on decades or lower or narrower time scales so these evolutionary trees and emergence are completely disjunct time scales okay so I don't think sampling animal viruses is, is any way predictive and I think what we need to do as, I, as I've said before and we published this is rather than just looking at all the animals in nature that's great for looking at evolution diversity that's what I do for a living I love that it's wonderful for that, but it doesn't really give you any indication of prediction, okay? It's about diversity and evolution. It doesn't tell you what's gonna jump next. I'll just skip this. Um, and some of these hosts, I should say, some of these hosts, uh, I'm, 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 I'm just, my time, I'm just gonna move on very quickly as I'm a bit behind. Um, I think I'll skip to the last slide here. So as I say, it's great to do. It's great to do that for ecology evolution. That's why I look at the sample of the virus field. I don't think that gives you predictability. So what do we need to do? I think what we need to do are right back to the start of my talk. Is if you want to know what's going to emerge next, you need to sample people at the human animal interface. That's the fault line. That's the tension point. That's where things jump. So that can be people are living around bat roots. Okay, I live in Sydney here. The local council build on bat populations. There are bats in people's garden. People pick them up. People bring them in to bat carers. It happens all the time. People working in the poultry industry, piggeries, abattoirs, on animal markets, animal hunting, bushmeat. All those people are on the front line. They're going to be exposed. They need to be regularly surveyed. And that surveillance can be using metagenomics, the tools that I use or JGI use, okay? Or there's some quite cool immunological surveillance tools like VIRSCAN that all can be used, which VIRSCAN is a very cool way. Steve Elledge from Harvard did this, where you can actually look at past exposure to a whole myriad of viral infections. And the idea is now we can do that for, for potentially emerging ones too. So there are, there are ways of doing this. But the key thing is to focus on humans at the interface rather than looking at all the animal population. Again, great for looking at diversity and ecology and nature is what I do, but I don't think that gives you predictability. Uh, I'm going to end there, I think, because I'm really a bit late. Um, and it's like, obviously, I'm just the kind of cheerleader here. Lots of people did all the work. I really haven't got time to acknowledge them. Here are the names. Very brief, I will mention Gemma Geegan from uh, Otago now, and even who... who I did a lot of work with on the vertebrate virus. It's been a very good collaborator. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Great. Uh, thank you, Eddie. That was a terrific talk. And I would now encourage all the attendees to place their questions in the q and I know we already have some questions coming in, uh, one of which is from Anna. She really liked your talk. Very interesting. And the question is, does the virus fear catalog also include uh, endogenized viruses? Yeah, that's a, yeah. Endogenous virus is a really good question. And you know, to be frank with you, we have completely ignored them over the years because it's actually, or in fact, I've, I've ignored retroviruses in general. It's actually quite hard to distinguish an exogenous one from an endogenous one when you have RNA sequence data. You've got to do a lot of extra work to work that. I've actually been quite lazy. Um, I've just realized that my data contains a huge diversity of retroviruses, okay, which I hadn't noticed before, that includes exogenous ones. So I think it's a, you're, you, you've hit your head on a really important thing, nail on the head there. We need to go back and look at the endogenous viruses. They actually give us a really good picture of the history of viruses. So I'm now going to do much more work on exogenous and endogenous retroviruses to see how they've, how they've jumped in. And also the other RNA viruses that can endogenize too. And we do find a few of those. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, another question is for your host jumping results. Do you see any examples of cross-class transmission or is it restricted to related species? Uh -huh. You know what? Can I go back to my slide very briefly? Because I skipped one, okay, because I was running out of time. I'm going to very quickly go back. This is a very great question, cross-class. So yes is the answer. Oops, sorry. Let me do that. Yes is the answer. So if you look at this, um, very, it's a very cool paper published in Nature just recently on rubella virus. And they published the idea was uh, Martin Beer, who's great, and Tony Gilbert, very good from publishers. And they showed that rubella virus has relatives in bats and other mammals. So that's kind of classic, you know, you know, mammalian virus story. What we've just found remarkably is that the Pacific electric ray, which is not a mammal, okay, uh, from California to fish, they have a rubella-like virus that falls absolutely in the middle of that mammalian set, okay? And we've tried very hard to prove its, its contamination, but it doesn't look like it at all. So um, absolutely is the answer. You, you can occasionally get cross-class cross transmission. So I've shown you a case that also hepatinoviruses too have has clearly gone from fish to terrestrial mammals recently in relatively recently in hepatinoviruses. So yes, it does happen. Quite why some viruses can do it, others can't do it, is not quite clear. Great. We have one more question from the audience. Uh, do you think it's possible that coronaviruses predate vertebrates? Yeah, I do actually. So when I one of the great questions is what I tend to do is I end my trees at the basal vertebrate because I'm interested in vertebrates. But of course you can then do, you can link those trees up to something else. And they often have invertebrates as being relatives, okay? So it could be that all these viruses actually go back to the ancestry of the animals in, as a whole. So they go back even further, even back to the origin of the metazoa. So I think that's very likely. And so one of the, one of the big questions is, I think in, in the whole of looking at virus fear is, as hosts have gone through major evolutionary changes, as, as we became multicellular, as we became animals, or as we became vertebrates, vertebrates went through massive gene duplications. Do you see in those big events in host evolution, do you see a change in the virus diversity that they carry? Or as you go, obviously as vertebrates appear, immune systems appear too, that immunity appears. And we don't really know the answer to that, but it's quite possible, I would say that, that coronaviruses have relatives that go back even into the invertebrates. And that's just going to require more sampling to, to sort that out. Great. And while we hopefully get a few more questions in, I'll, I'll ask a couple. Uh, one mm -hmm. relates to your kind of missing virus fear, and you showed nicely that, uh, you know, sequencing all these fish um, reveals a huge diversity of viruses. Do you have other hosts in mind um, that you're going to target next? Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do, fish I just did because they're kind of easy, right? And the ethics is very, like, and I also eat them afterwards, actually. So a lot of those fish I end up in my freezer. Um, so what we're trying to do, we're trying, trying to do kind of key gaps on the evolutionary tree. And so where we've not sampled things, we, we, so and I mentioned these key transitions in evolution. So becoming the first multicellular organism, becoming the first vertebrate, the first animal, those key transitions, 
what happens to the viruses those hosts carry at various points. So we're now we're looking at basal vertebrates, we're looking at basal eukaryotes to see what kind of viruses they, they might carry. I see on the, on, on, the, on the chat, there's a couple of questions, Tanya, as well. Yeah, and we got another few Q and A's here in. Uh, so mm. one is uh, for the fish, the ones that were sampled just yeah. after being caught, uh, that did not have detectable vertebrate viruses. Do you expect, or is there evidence that these same fish species also mm. lack detectable vertebrate viruses in other geographic locations? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. So one of the great things you need to remember all these virus sphere. We're, we're looking at one fish in one location, right? And it's a, it's a tiny sample. Our total universe, I've estimated our total universe of eukaryotic viruses is probably over 100 million, right, I suspect. And so we are, that's going to be, because, that's because we don't get it from one ship coming to Sydney Harbour, does not mean it's not in those, in those, in those um, animals elsewhere. I don't think there's a, there's a species of cellular life that doesn't have a virus. I'm pretty sure of it, okay. And they will vary by a geographic range. So we, yeah, again, it's just a massive, massive, sampling exercise and we've just at the moment scratched an absolutely minuscule surface of the virus sphere tiny tiny surface all right we got another couple of questions here one from curtis how do you distinguish between the viruses that are actually replicating in a host versus just being a host associated like prey? yeah that is probably the most difficult question it's a great question the most difficult thing in the whole of epigenomics right what we tend to do is, is do it on two two different ways so one is abundance so on average, the higher abundance, so if you take a fish, if you take a virus from a fish, the higher the abundance it is, the more likely it's replicating in the fish, particularly if it's high, more high abundance than a host gene marker, who's a host gene as a marker. And second, phylogeny. And what you tend to see is that vertebrate viruses tend to group together, okay? And invertebrate ones tend to be different. So you, if, if you get a fish virus and it clusters in the, you get a sample of virus from a fish and it clusters the invertebrates, it's probably, it's part of the fish diet or their microbiome rather than in the fish itself. And that, that does, it's not perfect, that does tend to work um, quite well. Um, so those two things, together, there are some complicated things. So the Pika burner viruses, people may know, are, are a particularly complicated thing now because they were traditionally thought to be vertebrate associated. But now we see, I see them in every, library we ever sequence so i suspect they're actually they're probably bacteriophage that have been misclassified as, as vertebrate viruses so it can go wrong but on average like i say it's phylogeny and abundance i should say all the fish ones i published there's a load of other viruses there that i haven't shown you that i think are non-fish associated they're in the fish but i think they're probably in protists or yeah part of fish diet or something Great. We have two more questions, and I think we have time for them. Uh, one is, what do you think uh, the least sampled, most important virus taxon is? Oh, <laughs> wow. Well, if I tell you, go and do it, uh, and I won't get credit. Um, I don't know. Let me think. <laughs> I would suggest. Uh, I don't know. I've always, I've always thought. Giardia, some of the basal, some of the, look, I think I'll tell you another big problem. Some of the, I think some of the basal eukaryotes, basal eukaryotes are very interesting, as are the archaebacteria. The other great thing, I'm, I'm going to slightly change the question. The other great thing about, difficult thing about metagenomics is the deeper you go back on the tree, and Simon will know as well, the harder it is to identify viruses because you're, you're doing this all based on similarity searching, right? And so as virus sequences diverge, it gets harder and harder and harder to detect them because their sequences are diverging. And I have a strong suspicion that there's a whole universe of viruses out there that we can't detect simply because we are using polymer RNA polymerases as a kind of bait, right? But if the bait gets too divergent, we can't sequence it. So for example, there are really no really clear examples, bona fide of, RNA viruses and archaebacteria. It's a cruel thing. I bet they're there. We can't detect them because their sequence is so divergent that we wouldn't know what they looked like even if we saw them. So I think the great one of the great challenges for the to me, the biggest challenge of the whole metagenomics, the whole thing, is can we develop techniques that can identify these really divergent viruses that have no similarity in sequence at all to the ones we look at now? And then if we can identify them, 
how do we put them in a phylogeny if we can't align them, right? That is a huge problem. And that may require protein structural stuff to be done. That's actually a whole different area of complexity. Great. Uh, one more question in the Q&A. Uh, brilliant synthesis of these large viral patterns. I'm interested in your findings on virus within host communities and whether they are infected common parasites that could drive those associations. Okay. Sort of thinking about your Russian doll. Yeah. Yeah, look, I agree. And no one's really thought about this. And I think you can see a little bit now in the human microbiome. And people are talking about the human virome. And by that, the human virome, they normally mean phage, okay? So how the human phage virome interacts with the microbiome and how that interacts human health and disease. So that's now being, that, that's now going on. Um, you know, so it's very, it's very remarkable to us that Plasmodium vivax carries this, this nano virus. We've, we've done subsequent work and every single vivax strain we see has it, right? And of course, virus has different properties than, than other Plasmodium, other mal human malaria. I think what that opens up more broadly is the question saying, are there these larger scale interactions that shape bigger disease patterns that we've, that we've yet to, 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 to determine. And, and, and one of the other great questions for the future is how do microbes interact, right? What's, what's, how does that work? And these are, we are only just getting to those questions. At the moment we are in this, and Simon and I are in this work, we're in this massive diversity exploring phase, right? So this is a new age of discovery, we're like 19th century, you know, explorers. Eventually the key thing now is to say, right, we've got this diversity, what explains the patterns? And that's the, that's the big thing for the future. So the younger people, I'll be, I'll be long gone by the time that's worked out, right? But that's the, that's the big thing for the future. Great. Uh, we have another couple of questions that came in through the chat. Um, and that is, uh, how, can we, how can we tell the difference between a virus infecting fish versus virus hitchhiking or ride on a fish, infecting fish microbiome yeah. or other organisms living yeah. in on fish, et cetera? I was, yeah, I said, to I, yeah, question. abundance and abundance and phylogeny yeah. is very hard to do there. It's very hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one last question in the Q&A here. How does co-infection of a single host by many different viruses impact the infection dynamics in nature? Yeah. So look, again, I, all, most of the animals that I sample I, uh, and are completely healthy. Right. So when I buy these fish, right, they, you know, they're full of virus. They taste fine. You know, they look absolutely healthy. I, we, I don't think we know how, but the birds we sample are absolutely full of virus. You have no, no noticeable disease syndrome at all. You wouldn't know they were ill. How all these, vir how all these viruses interact, if at all, how they impact the health of the host, we just don't know that yet. And I think, again, that's the next step. So once we through this discovery phase, the next thing is to, is to address these bigger questions. And I, it's, a, I, it's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. Great. And I think we're at the end of it. No more questions. I would like to thank you again for a terrific talk. Our pleasure. And thank all the attendees for their time. And we hope to see you at the next Vega seminar. <laughs>